It's time to dig in and discuss the questions on the minds of today's leaders. You are listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. This is where we get vulnerable, raw, and authentic about the stuff that really matters. Now, here is your host, Kathleen Reeson. Welcome to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. I'm your host, Kathleen Reeson, and today we are talking all about better decision making faster. So who wouldn't want to make better decisions? This is something that when I think about decision making, I think, how long does it really take us to make a decision? Because in any given day, we are making hundreds, if not thousands of decisions, depending on your day. I find that when my, as a parent, when my kids are around, I'm making even more decisions because they ask me simple questions like, could I have this snack? Or can I, can I ride my bike? Or can I slide down the stairs with a box on my head? That did happen once. I'm not even making that up. But the thing is they get older, they stop asking and then they just do it. And so we, my goal is that I can support them in making better decisions faster so that they don't get hurt. And that's really the context of today that it's not just about kids that we get to teach us, we actually get to learn this for ourselves. And it's something that's been really supportive for me as I have grown in my leadership and the kinds of decisions that I get to make, what I found as I've grown businesses and I've had more risk on the line is that the decisions that I'm making, they have bigger consequences. So before, like for example, if, if I were to say, should I stay at this job or should I leave this job? If that was the decision making as an employee that I'm making, yes, that's important because it, it absolutely has a ripple effect that affects my family that, and I could draw out what that ripple might look like if I were to choose to leave a job. And so that is absolutely a critical, important decision. As an employer, when I'm making a decision about how I move this company forward, I'm impacting tons of people and I'm impacting their families and their communities. So the ripple gets even larger. And that's why effective decision making and and really making better decisions faster is so important. I believe that decision making is an art that you can practice. And the thing about decision making is that let's actually look at what ineffective decision making is, because I believe that what what people think ineffective decision making is and what it actually is, that there's there's a divide there. I believe that when we think about ineffective decision-making, we often think of it as bad decisions. Well, I made a decision and and it didn't turn out how I wanted. I don't think that's actually ineffective decision-making. I think that's creating consequences that we don't like. So decision-making, it actually can happen very, very fast. Decision-making happens in an instant. It's the period before the decision and the period after the decision that we do or don't like that create positive or negative results. And as we become more proficient at decision-making, All we're saying is that we made a choice, here are the consequences, and we liked the consequences or we didn't like the consequences, and that we're okay with it. We can get into an analysis paralysis period, which means that that happens before and it happens after a decision making. So a decision making period, that point, we can get into analysis paralysis. We don't want this to happen, and that is really what we're talking about today. When you get into analysis paralysis before a decision, you're saying, I don't know what to do. I've got all these things to think about. I need this piece of information. I need that piece of information. And I've got to have all of this data or decision points before I can actually make the decision. And when we come from that place, it takes us forever to make a decision because sometimes we don't even do it. We just push it off and off and off. And then when we actually make the decision, when we that momentary point happens and we make the decision, then we can spend the next period of time, be it short or long, lamenting about the decision. That is ineffective decision-making. That doesn't work because we're spending so much energy around the decision, but not actually with the decision. So today, what we're talking about is separating all of that time that we spend before and after a decision, and let's actually just focus on the decision that we get to make. Let's actually focus on the decision we get to make. And so what happens is that we get really caught up in almost like an anxiety state. Okay, let's just say you've got a big decision. Okay, let's look at one that maybe maybe we all face at some point. It's what is my next step in life? Now, it doesn't matter if you're an employer, an employee, a leader in a company, even a parent, even a, it, this affects all of us. But let's just say the stakes are high. You're a leader in a company. And, and right now, let me be clear, the stakes are high in business. And why I say this, I have a friend who 
He has this, this really cool business. He knows poker gambling really, really well. And he's combined this with his strategic planning business. So he calls it Advantage Play. Hi, Joel. And he was saying the other day about how if you look at the last few years, especially with COVID and, and all the dynamics that happen in, a, in the business world, we were really focused on the employee and making sure that we were employee centric. So you saw a lot of focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, culture, really making sure that the employees were comfortable. I'll use that word, that we were inclusive. And so that was our focus. Now we're moving into a point with the recession where we're saying, all right, we're going to hold back on our cash. We're going to make some major changes to our company to focus on sustainability. And these changes aren't necessarily going to be what our employees like. They are going to be uncomfortable. So in a, in a great period where we are growing, we're robust, we're filling our pocketbooks, we are working on comfort for our employees. But when we are in more of a recession and a pullback period, we've got to move the company forward and it's often not comfortable. Okay, so we've got that discomfort. When we're in a good period, it's, hey, as a leader, I'm gonna pull back. I want the discomfort to be on me, but not my employees. But when we're in the period that we're headed into or that we're in right now, it means that our employees are going to feel that. And there's nothing we can do about it. And so then what happens is that we see tension between employees and employers. And that is the lay of the land. It is how it happens. And so what ha what we need to really focus on is that we can make these decisions faster because what our employees really want is clarity, trust, respect, confidence. And that happens when the leaders of the company say, this is where we're headed. And when we can be vulnerable about that and say, I don't know, I, I have a feeling I know where, we're where it's gonna land, but these consequences that we're gonna pay, we're just calculating them. They, they may fall exactly where we want them and they may not, but together we're going to deal with this. And that level of vulnerability and decision-making is really important because you want to say that with an air of, hey, I'm not just picking somewhere on a map that we're headed. I am actually saying, this is how we're going to move the company forward. Are there going to be some unintended consequences that are uncomfortable? Absolutely. And we'll deal with them together because we're a team. Now, when we come from that spot, it gives comfort to our employees in a very uncomfortable time. So see that difference where as a leader, we are absolutely facing uncomfortable decisions, but we still get to make them. And the, the, there was a McKinsey survey that went out and it asked, it said, if you have more information, do you think it leads to better decisions, worse decisions, or the same? So same results. If you have more information, does it lead to better decisions, better outcomes? less desirable outcomes or the same. And according to the McKinsey survey, the amount of information you have, so getting more information, if you ever had a decision where you say, gosh, if I just had a little bit more information, I'd be able to make this decision. Well, according to this McKinsey survey, more information actually equals the same results. So more information overall is not changing the outcome of the results. Well, if this is all the case, then, hey, here's some really free news. As leaders, we can make decisions and know that the consequences, we're absolutely going to pay either way. There's always consequences. Whenever you make a choice, which is a decision, there's a consequence. Choice equals consequence. That naturally is going to happen. There's nothing we can do to change that. But the difference is that we can be okay with the consequences even if we don't like them. We can be okay with the consequences even if we don't like them because we can't predict every single consequence that's going to happen. But when we know that there's going to be consequences that happen that are unintended that we are going to deal with, then we can ride with the consequences. So when you can position your team and even your mindset that way, that is a place of power. That is where your team can say, look, we know we're headed into an uncharted territory. If you're going somewhere where you've never been, you can't possibly predict what is gonna happen because you've never been there. And unless someone else in your market space, in your community, in your industry, unless they've been there before, you don't know what's gonna happen. So you can sit and guess about it all you want. You can gather information. You can kill yourself gathering spreadsheets and data points. But at the end of the day, if you're going somewhere that we've never gone before, then more information equals the same results. I mean, 
Wow, think about it that way. Now, this whole ineffective decision-making conversation that we've been having, how much do you think it's costing companies across the world? Just think about that. In that same McKinsey survey, across the world, $250 million annually. I mean, wow, ineffective decision-making, $250 million annually. Now, that may seem like a giant number, and well, but Kathleen, I'm not this huge company. I don't know what size company you're running, but think about this. This is the percentage that you're going to want to know for your own business. So just take your payroll dollars, the total amount that you put to payroll every single month, and you multiply that by 37%. So basically a third of it. By 37%, that is the amount of time and energy that is wasted on ineffective decision-making. Now that number gets real. Let's just say for sake of math, you have a million dollars of payroll. That means over $330,000 is wasted to ineffective decision-making. That's a big number. Now, if you want to reclaim that, if you want to get some of that back, then we get to look at the process that we're using for decision-making. All right. That's the context of today's show. So when we think about decision-making, I want to get, get really real here for just a minute. I have had a lot of calls lately, a lot of uh, conversations with some good friends that are in leadership positions with companies or with their own companies. And there's a lot of big stuff going on. I met with a friend for lunch the other day who uh, his brother, who's also his business partner, just found out that he had colon cancer has colon cancer and he started chemo and radiation. And so now they're figuring out how do they support him both in the business and in life. Now this, this guy's wife who the one who has cancer, this guy's wife is terminal with cancer as well. And they have a seven year old and a two year old. So my friend is now saying my brother, I get to face some real life or death conversations. He's got kids. He's my business partner. All these things are coming up for him. And he's attempting to leave. He's the, the business. He owns two different businesses, and he's attempting to move those forward. So that's, that's a lot. I have a friend who lives in Fort Myers, lived in Fort Myers. And Hurricane Ian, she sat in a storage locker in her condo, wasn't able to escape, evacuate. She sat in there for 12 hours while the building shook. She heard horrific sounds the the water uh, coming in she actually left her condo uh, yesterday morning at 7 a.m was able to walk to the edge of the island and then get a ride and ended up at a, a one of her friend's condos that wasn't affected she lost everything i mean every, she walked away with a wagon and with a grocery cart that was it some suitcases i mean everything She's running a business and she's saying, I got my laptop and that's about it. And I get to restart. And here she is in her fifties. And this is the conversation that she's got to have. Okay, so, so these things are real. I have a friend where we had, he's running a business. We had a hailstorm oh, about a month ago, totaled his car. It changed his mindset to where now his business is actually shrinking because his ability to make decisions and lead it have lessened. These are real situations. And what I can tell you that as a leader, that we can't ignore the reality of the messy middle that we find ourselves in. You may be able to relate to one of those stories. Perhaps it's something that you're walking through. For me, it's my, the anniversary of my mom's death is this Saturday. And so this week, I know it affects, affects me. It affects my family. It affects my kids. It affects my dad. It, so that absolutely affects how I will show up. And I get to know that because how I lead my company is going to be directly impacted by that feeling. And if we just shove that to the side and say, oh, that doesn't have anything to do with how we choose to move forward with our companies, then we're missing out on a big piece because we cannot make effective decisions when we make them from the messy middle. 
So my friend that's in the trauma of a hurricane right now, she can't make a decision about what a year or two years or 10 years down the road is going to be. She can't even make a decision about the end of the night. What she can make is a decision about what the next moment represents for her. That's it. And so we get to recognize where people are when we're in, where we are when we're in these decision making points. Because sometimes we get to offload that space. And I'll talk about what that means here, how we offload that space in just a minute. But before we get to that, I want to go on a quick break. And I want to give you while you're on this break, it's a working break. I want to give you a thought about the heavy stuff that's going on in this world right now, whether it be some of the, the challenges in Ukraine, if you're affected by that. Maybe it is the the hurricane that just hit. Maybe it is your own storm that's happening in your own life. Whatever that is for you, think about the heaviness that exists in this world right now while we're on this break. All right, you're listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. Be back in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. And when I left you for that commercial break, the question I had for you was to think about the heaviness that's going on in this world, whatever that heaviness is for you because today's topic is better decision-making faster. And what I just shared with you before the break is that we can't make decisions from that heavy point. It just doesn't work. So what do you do with those feelings of heaviness, whether you're experiencing them or other people are experiencing them and you're feeling all of that? Because we are an empathetic being. That's the, the part of being a human being is that we can experience other people's experiences which means we can feel what they're feeling. And sometimes that doesn't feel great. And it's hard to separate what's ours and what's theirs, what's the outside world. And so we get to, if we're feeling that, if we're going through the messy the stuff, what really is supportive is to have somebody, a coach, an advisor, a friend, someone around you. Some people use counselors for this particular way, a coach. There are lots of people out there, but you get to find a person where you can offload these feelings, these things that are coming up. I'll tell you one of the ways that I use this this morning as I was talking with a few of my friends, I listened to my friend who was in the, the hurricane. She did this 11 minute LinkedIn live this morning and with tears shared the most beautiful experience of what she's going through. And it is heart wrenching to hear. And so I had that on my heart. And then I have another friend, the one that I was describing whose, whose car got destroyed in the hurricane and who whose business has dried up, who's really having some challenges. And I have that on my heart. And then I've got my friend whose brother is uh, going through cancer treatments and whose wife is terminal. But I've got that on my heart, but I cannot be effective with all of that on my heart. And so what I got to do was I got to share what was coming up for me. I got to get to the next layer, which was I've got my own stuff that my mom died two years ago. And really experiencing that grief and, and grief. We could do a whole show just on grief and how you lead through grief or while you're in grief, you still get to move a company forward. But what that looks like, because most of the days for me, it's no big deal. But what I notice is there's those moments, there's those moments in time. And so we get to just let ourselves peel that back like an onion and say, well, I didn't know that was there, but letting it come out and having a person that could just receive that in a very non-judgmental way 
and just say, oh, okay, cool. I'm here to listen for you. And so when that stuff, when you can set that aside, then there's a feeling of lightness, not heaviness, it's lightness. And that's a place where you can make decisions. And so if you're feeling that heaviness, know that that's a, a place that you are choosing to exist. And there's probably lots of great reasons as to why you're there. There is no judgment on that but you get to set it aside, which means give it to somebody else. I used to think I could work myself through this process, but what I found is that very few people can do that. I mean, there are some, there are some highly talented people that can both coach themselves and uh, be in the moment with it, but that is the few and far between. And it's much easier to have a trusted person in your life to hand that to for a little bit to just set it aside. And then when you have that feeling of lightness, then you can make decisions, then you can lead. And so if you are in a leadership role and you're thinking you're feeling that heaviness, really find some, call me, send me a note, or call up a friend, call up a counselor, get a therapist, get a coach, get an advisor, somebody that you can give this to. And here's the context. You don't have to say to that person, I want you to solve this for me because there is no problem that you're solving in this moment. You are offloading the feelings of heaviness so that you can move forward and solve decisions quickly. You're not asking them to solve your problem. You're saying, hey, I get to get this off of my heart, off of me and just put it out into the world. Because when you do that, you have that experience and that feeling of lightness. And that is where you make decisions from. Never in the history of ever has anything been created in that darkness space, in that heaviness, in that messy middle. That is just not where creativity lives. It's not where the, the mind can think from a fresh perspective. It's not where we make healthy decisions. So we set all of that stuff aside in a healthy way and we say that will be here. It will be here tomorrow. It will be here the next day. But in this moment, I get to be light. And that is a moment by moment choice that you get to make. And so that is a part that we call grounding. It's really saying, I'm gonna be clear. I'm gonna be focused on what it is that I get to create. And so there is a GLT process that I'm gonna walk you through. And it's one that I use when I am making decisions and so that I can make decisions fast. And it's the same one that I coach my clients on. And it's one that I'm sharing with you today. So when you are setting aside the heaviness. You are grounding into what is working, what is right. I'm going to use this word right because, well, we'll talk about that in just a second, but you're, you're, you're grounding into what is right with you, what is working. Okay. That's the G really ground, set aside the heaviness and focus on the lightness. And what that means is that you can think clearly now. Now, if you remember back, uh, we've talked a couple weeks ago, we talked about the brain and how that really works with your emotions and how you can use your emotions to really drive uh, enhanced in, in business results. Well, in this case, and I'll give you the high level again on this, if you think about the brain, you've got two different sections, lots of different sections, but we're gonna be general here. You've got your upper frontal cortex and then you've got your downstairs, your lower context. That's where our emotions live in that lower section. And upstairs, that's where our rational brain lives. Okay. So think about front of brain, back of brain, or upstairs, downstairs, however you want to classify it. But upstairs is our rational, logical brain and downstairs is our emotional brain. And so when we are young, we spend a lot of time in our lower section of our brain. That is not where decisions are made faster. When we go upstairs to our logical side, this is where we can make quick decisions. The challenge is when we get stuck between the two, so if we are in the downstairs brain, but we think we can make a fast decision, that's not where it happens. So oftentimes when we get into analysis paralysis, we go up to the upstairs brain and we say, oh, well, this would be a great decision. I know exactly where I want to go. But then we walk downstairs to the downstairs brain and we say, but if we do that, here's what might happen. And we don't like that. And so we go back to the upstairs brain and we say, yes, but it's going to be okay. And here's why. And we go to the downstairs brain and anxiety comes in and we say, but, 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 and that jumping up and down or running up and down that ladder between our downstairs brain and our upstairs brain, that is causes us exhaustion and it costs us a lot of time. And that is why we slow down our decision-making. 
when I said 37% of our decisions are ineffective, this is what I'm talking about. We make decisions from this place, or quite frankly, we don't make decisions from this place. We sit in this paralysis of not to making a decision. And what it might look like if you're seeing somebody else in this position, or if you had a mirror to watch yourself, you would just kind of look like a blank stare because in your mind, you're having this intense conversation, but there's no words actually spoken. Now, if it is something that you are having a verbal conversation with somebody, you could hear the anxiety. Now, no joke, I was in a long range planning session a couple, I don't know, it was last week. And we were talking all about where we got to go with this company. And we had a really great plan lined up. And then this lady says, well, I'm not sure if we can get the revenue to support that because, uh, and, and you could hear it in her voice, because, uh, well, we would have to really sell the value in order to get it. And she slowed down and I could tell what was happening was she was saying, I don't really know if the value is there and I don't know if I can sell the value. So you can start to hear this upstairs, downstairs. She knows where logically she wants to go, but downstairs the anxiety is set in about, she doesn't know that the value is there, that she could sell it, but then she goes back up to her logical mind and that's why her voice and her tone started to slow down. So in that case, I was able to see what was happening and interrupt it as, as the leader and say, hey, I, I hear you. This is, this is a value-based conversation. And we were able to articulate in a very uh, factual way, what is the logic that's going on here? And when she could visually see it, she could step out of the anxiety of it. And so, so really knowing that it's grounding, that G grounding in that those emotions are set aside. This is not an emotional-based conversation. We're actually looking at, from a logical perspective, what do we get to create? And so that is G. The second step in the process, the L in the GLT, L is listening. Okay, listening isn't necessarily to those around us, it's to ourselves, and it's to that intuition piece as well. So we're tapping into something that's, that's much bigger than ourselves, but we want to listen for the cues around us. In the situation I was just describing with the lady that was very uncomfortable and, and you could visually see the change from upstairs to downstairs brain that happening, I was listening to the cues around me because I want to make an effective decision, but I want to see what's happening. If I'm doing that for myself, I'm noticing that that's my trend, that's what's happening, that's my pattern, then I can interrupt it. Okay, so we're listening to ourselves, we're listening to the cues that are happening around us, and we're listening for just, just quieting ourselves when we're making that decision. We're listening for anything that's these patterns that are happening around us so we can understand what's the, if we're one of making a decision, we've got to come from a quiet place. Okay, quick decisions from loud environments rarely result in what we want. So we're going to make big decisions. Make sure you're in an environment where you can be grounded and you can listen to the cues and the patterns around you. All right. And the last one, and this, this is the biggest one in the GLT process, T is trust. T is trust. Because this is what often I see happen. So leaders get through this process of actually making the decision. So make, they have all this buildup process, then they actually make the decision. But then they spend the time doing what? Second guessing. And we spend all this time second guessing the decisions that we made. And that, quite frankly, is exhausting. It is exactly what contributes to the 37% of ineffective payrolls because we spend time second guessing ourselves. This is where we actually sabotage our sales and our companies because we don't trust the decision that we made. We don't give it time to play out. So now all of a sudden we make backpedal decisions. Oh, I didn't really want to do that. Oh, no, don't do that. We get, we get freaked out. And so we start backpedaling. This is where our team gets confused and they lose trust in us. They lose confidence in us. They lose respect for us because what they see is a leader that made a decision but then doesn't stick with it. They see a leader that told them something to do but then gave them different directions. And what really is at the center of this is that when we make decisions, there's often a long-term payout and short-term consequences, which means we're gonna feel the pain first before we get to the long-term payout, and we're going to quit before we get to the long-term payout because we don't like the short-term consequences. But a leader that trusts, that use this process, that says, whew, 
okay, I know there's going to be some short-term pain, but this is for a long-term gain and can stick with it, can then realize the long-term success. They can realize the long-term success. But oftentimes we quit before we can get there. Is that resonating with you? Have you ever done that? That's something that I'm noticing for myself. I used to be really, really great at long, knowing the short pain, the short-term pains, and then really holding on for the long-term success. But what I noticed as those short-term pains had gotten much, I'll use the word, more painful, especially with COVID. And a lot of these last few years as leaders, we've dealt with a lot. We don't want to feel the pain anymore. Any of you agree with that? I mean, the pain is severe at times. And so knowing that that pain is there, it's like, oh, do I really want to work through the pain? Now, this isn't, this might not necessarily be physical agony, although it might, but it could also be employees quitting. I'm working with a company right now who has had some tremendous turnover. And really what's happening is their culture has dramatically shifted, but the, the leaders haven't necessarily stood in the vision. They've stood in the mechanics of the company. So saying, we're going to reach 700 times growth on our return on it for our investors in the next 10 years. But that's what their investors want to see. But the employees are saying, man, I've been through so much these last few years with this company. I, I don't want to hang on for that. And so the employees are turning over, meaning they're leaving the company. They're having a hard time bringing new employees in to match that. But the real challenge is the vision is only defined by finances. It's not defined by anything else that the, that the employees can really grasp onto. So while these leaders of these companies made great decisions on the financial performance, what they didn't do was make decisions about what the vision of the company would look like. So they stopped halfway in that process because it got too painful. They got some reactions from the employees that they didn't like, and so they didn't complete the vision process. And had they done that, had they stuck with it, I think what would have happened, what may have happened, is that they wouldn't have seen the turnover that they're experiencing right now. But this is the reality of what happens. We pay those short-term prices, and then we want to shift directions because we want to get the short-term pain away from us. And while that may feel good in the short term, it really doesn't set us up for long-term success. So as a leader, we really get to know going into any sort of decision-making that there is a short-term pain for a long-term gain. And we get to trust that we're setting ourselves and our companies up for success and we're willing to pay the short-term pain. So when we trust, we know that that's what that is. As soon as we make a decision, we've got those short-term pain. So short-term pain, long-term gain. Sticking with a decision long enough to see the long-term gain, that is a practice, an art that can be developed over time. It's one of the biggest challenges I see with new leaders or even with experienced leaders who've been through some trauma, which if you've been a leader for the last few years, you've experienced. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, there's more. You're listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspire Choices Network. Talk to you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Today, we've been talking all about better decision making faster. 
Now, one of the other challenges I see with decision making in an organization is who makes what decisions. So oftentimes we can be almost control like in decisions as a leader. We might want to make the decisions because if somebody's going to pay the consequence, ultimately, every single decision that's made in a company, the CEO is responsible for all of them, even if it's made at such a very basic level, because guess what? It all rolls uphill. So that is can sometimes be taken very literally, meaning the CEO wants to make every single decision. I worked with a company, I was working with the CEO, and he was exhausted because every single time something was a question in this company, every single dollar that was spent, it went through him. So he didn't want that necessarily to be the case, but when somebody made a decision and he didn't like it, he would almost punish them. So choice, consequence, same thing, but he would say, hey, somebody made this choice. I don't like the, the, what was happening. I didn't like the answer. And so I would go, this, the CEO in this case, he would go to this person and he would say, mm, I didn't like that. Please don't do that again. And what he was training this person to do was say, every single decision, I've got to run by the CEO. And so that's what happened. Everyone in his company, every time they had a decision would come to him. Well, we make hundreds of decisions in a day. And this CEO, he was exhausted because constant, he couldn't get any work done. He would end up shutting his door, but every single, maybe like five minutes, knock, 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 knock. Hey, CEO, I've got a question for you. What do you want me to do with this? And they would hand him these questions and he would answer them and then they would go back to their desk. So he did a really great job training his team to ask him for every single question. The challenge was he didn't like it and it wasn't working because he was exhausted. There weren't enough of him. He couldn't grow the company because he was spending so much of his time focusing on the day to day. And he came to me and he said, but Kathleen, I don't understand why can't they make their own decisions? And he didn't realize that this was something that he had created. People came to him with every single decision. And so he actually got to unravel that. And he got to get comfortable with some of the consequences that are going to happen because other people make decisions. You're not going to like them. It's going to set the company back and it's okay because the goal is that we learn from him. And so as he started this process, he got to go clear with his team. He got to say, look, I realize that this is the creation of me. I have created an environment where you come to me with questions. And what I want you to know is that these kinds of questions are ones that I want you to come talk to me about, but everything else you can make the decision and it's okay to fail. I'll stand with you. I will be there with you. It's, it's okay. We've got room to fail and grow, which really, all companies grow from the failure. There is not one company in the world that hasn't experienced some kind of failure. That's what fuels success. And so when we make decisions, we get to trust ourselves, remember the T in the process, that we are going to fail and it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to avoid it, but we're also going to succeed. And in business, the goal is that you succeed more than you fail. That is really the metric more successes than failures, because when that happens, you're in the positive and then your financials can follow from there. So I just gave you the formula for business. It is not scientific in any way, but more successes than failures equals successful business. Yay. And believe me, I'm coming to you speaking on the radio as somebody who's had lots of failures in business. I mean, all kinds. I've also had lots of successes. And at this point I've had a little bit more success than failure. So I'm doing all right. But there are also those moments where I was talking about earlier when the world gets heavy, when you're experiencing these, this heaviness, that it often feels like we are flip-flopped or when your financials are indicating that perhaps you're flip-flopped. So you've got more failures than you do successes, but we get to know that it is a formula. So we just get to flip that. So maybe our failures are up. We get to flip that to our successes. What does that have to do with decision-making? This is giving you permission to know that you're going to fail sometimes and it's okay. So when you set that aside, that this stuff of the failure, this concern, this paralysis, this fear of failure, what's left is that we're going to make decisions and we're going to know that we're going to like some of them and we're not going to like others. We're going to like the results of some of them. We're not going to like the results of others. We're going to pay in the short term, but we're going to gain in the long term. When we know that all of this stuff is happening, and we can label it for what it is, that this is a natural part of the decision-making process, then that's freedom right there. The way we run our companies changes when we really embrace that. 
because we know that really, can you lose? If you're going to fail sometimes, that's proven. It's going to happen. But you know that you could turn that into a success based on what you know. Is it really a failure? Like, that's not a bad thing. It just doesn't always feel good. Who I've had lots of those where it doesn't feel good. In fact, I just went through, I went through all of my results from last month. And I put down every, this is a process that I work through each month. And it's really supporting me in how I make decisions on how I spend my time, the types of, of uh, meetings that I set up, the ideas that I choose to move forward. What I do is I go through the last month and I say, this is how I spent my time. And these are the results that it produced. Now, here's the tricky part. A lot of the stuff that I work on now produces long-term results. The short-term pain for me is that my metrics don't move up as fast as I want them to because they're long, it's a long-term play. So right now I've got a revenue target that I'm working on for my business. And over the course of the last month, I moved it up. Well, I, I moved it up 8.9%, but the beginning of the month, I made that movement. So the, within the first week of the month, the last three weeks of the, mo of the month, there was no movement for myself or the team. And that was frustrating to me. But I met with the team and I got to say, okay, that's short-term pain because we're working on a really long-term goal here. And it does not have to be tackled in three weeks or a month or two months. And in fact, in three or four months, we could have a 50% jump. And even though my ego says, but I want that 0.1%, I want to go from 8.9 to 9% because, oh, do I want to? That's not really the game I'm up to. And so when I'm making decisions about how I spend my time, I get to make decisions from that long-term perspective. And I get to tell my ego, hey, even though you want to see that jump from 8.9 to 9%, it's okay. You're setting up long-term plays. Look at how you spent your month, your last month, your time the last month. You worked on long-term plays that aren't going to pay out for three, four, five, six, seven months, or you know, three, four, five years. These are long-term plays. To have an expectation that you're going to create a result in less than 30 days when the work that you're you're really where you're putting your time is to set up for years or lots of months. See how your mind can get tricky, but that's where the trust comes in. You make a decision based on how you spend your time or whatever it is for you. So in my case, I made a decision based on how I spend my time for long-term, but then I can get frustrated because the short-term results aren't there. That's the pain I'm talking about when you say short-term pain. It's saying, oh, but I want those short-term results. Now, knowing that, knowing that my ego likes a little short-term results, I know I can sprinkle some of those in. So I know that going forward in this month, I get to sprinkle in a little bit of work that will give me some short-term results so that both myself and my team can see those short-term results and know that we're working on the long-term. So that's how you create that balance there. But it's knowing, it's knowing from that experience, so saying, oh, okay, I felt that pain, Let's build next month. Let's build next month so that we set ourselves up for success. Yes, thank you. Got that point. That's where celebrations are important. Absolutely. So recognizing that, that you, we are creating these celebrations when we do hit long-term results because we may have been working on them forever. It's very easy to blow past them, but there could have been you know, six months of no what looked like progress. But then all of a sudden you reach this milestone. We got to celebrate that. That's really important because there may not be another big milestone for another year, another two years or three years. So we got to celebrate our success along the way as we remind ourselves we have these short-term wins. That's what's really important. That's where we set ourselves up for success. But when we're in the decision-making process, remember GLT, okay? T is that trust piece. And so it's remembering what your game is. We can oftentimes get distracted by somebody else's game, especially in decision-making. We see what somebody, what another business down the street's doing. Oh, I hear this a lot in consumer-based businesses. 
I used to own some gyms. And even in our decision making, when we were running uh, oh, Black Friday specials or New Year specials, everybody thought that people rushed into gyms January 1st. And so we deeply discount January 1st. But the challenge is by March 1st, they're all gone. By February 15th, they're all gone. By February 1st, 50% of them are gone. And the 50% that are there that came in January 1st, only about 10% of them are actually working out. And so it sets us up for failure. As a gym owner, one of the hardest things that we said was, you know what? We're not going to market, in the, we're not going to be somebody that's going to call forward all those new people on January 1st. Instead, what we're going to do is focus on the spring break crowd, the right after spring break crowd, the people that went on these beach vacations and they weren't happy with their current state of health, with their bodies, with their endurance. And so they come back to the gym and they say, now I'm ready to commit because we found that that customer stayed for a really long time. Their retention rate was significantly higher. Where we saw our January 1st people, where almost none of them were there by March 1st, the, the post spring break crowd by December 31st, almost 50% of them were still members. It's huge retention. That's a significant difference between the January 1st crowd versus the post spring break crowd. But do you know what it was like to make the decision to say, we're not gonna go after the January 1st crowd? Can you imagine what it's like to tell your team, hey, I know that there's a bunch of cash that we could get coming in if we went with this January 1st crowd, but we're not going to do that. We're going to wait. We're going to take a gamble. We're going to make a choice and we're going to pay some short-term pain because that was real painful when January and February, there wasn't revenue coming in off of those new members, but we're going to wait till the post spring break crowd came in. And, and in that case, it paid off. But January and February, that was rough. It was real easy to turn that around and say, oh, maybe we should just go after this market Ugh, and go back on our word. But we got to trust the decision. We got to ground, listen, and trust. We used that entire process to say, hey, this is how we're going to move forward. And it was a powerful way to describe that when you make a decision and you hold to it, and you're willing to pay the short-term prices, you get a longer-term payout. How many times are you paying those, you made the decision, you paid the short-term price, you didn't want to pay it anymore, and so then you made a new decision that was different and in conflict with the original decision. Now, what happened to your team when that happened? When you backpedaled, did your team lose respect? Did you, did your own confidence wave? This is all stuff that really is reality. Is it okay to renegotiate a, once you've made a decision? Absolutely, it's okay. But if you create a pattern of that, then you get to look at where is your team right now? Because your team, oftentimes when this happens, what I see in companies is that's when we get into lack of trust, lack of respect, lack of confidence for the leaders. All right, I'm going to leave you with that for just one second. We'll go on a quick break. And when we get back, we'll wrap all of this up. You're listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Talk to you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Welcome back to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Today, we've been talking all about better decision making faster. So how do you improve your decisions and the, the speed, the confidence, and the results. What we've learned is that more information means the same results. So if you're sitting around saying, I've just got to get more, I've got to understand different pieces, the reality is that that is not what the data shows. The data shows that what you have right now in any given situation is the data that you need to make a decision. Now, is it okay if there's a critical piece of information missing and you get to go find it? Absolutely, but then you're making a decision to find that information. So in essence, you are making a decision. That's the beauty of decision making. So really ground this GLT process that we talked about today. Ground, put that heavy stuff aside. We, I totally get that the world is 
got a lot of heavy stuff going on right now. And I bet you're experiencing it in some way. I am through my own stuff, but my friends are, my clients are, and it is a heavy time. And we cannot make decisions from that standpoint. So we absolutely get to set those aside, use a coach, an advisor, a friend, a, a counselor, a therapist, however that is, but set it aside. And you're not asking them to solve any problems. You're just asking them to listen as you set those aside. And then you move in to the L. So G was ground, L was listening. Listening is understanding what your patterns and the patterns of those around you are. You are looking for people that are backpedaling or if you're backpedaling, what's actually going on here so that you can look at the cues of where you get to go and head, what's standing in the way. And T is trust. When you finally make that decision, when you say, this is the path that we're going into, then you can understand that they're just consequences that you're going to pay. You're going to pay some short-term consequences for a long-term gain. Do not change your decision based on that. Focus on the long-term play. If you're like me and your ego says you want some short-term results, build that in. Celebrate those so that you can get to the long-term play. G-L-T. Ground, listen, trust. Very important as you think about better decision-making faster. Now, next week, we're talking about succession planning and why every senior leader should have one. Now, I'm not talking about the ins and outs of writing the succession plan. We're not getting a piece of paper out and the mechanics of it. What I'm talking about is what is the succession plan for your company? Like, what does it look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? Does it move on without you? Are you carrying it? We're talking about long-term planning. <laughs> I'm working on this with a lot of companies right now. And the biggest challenge is that in this environment that we're playing in, it can be hard to think about a year down the road or three years down the road. It can be very difficult to think about seven, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Because gosh, if we could just get past the next year, we'd be happy. I mean, the, the turmoil that's coming at us is just pretty thick. And so, wow, supplier issues, employee issues. I can't think about five, 10 years down the road. I can only think about a year down the road. That is the current situation of a lot of companies. And so what we're really talking about is how do we balance that? How do we focus on the current load, but also the, the long-term succession? You could tie that right into what we talked about today, the short-term pain, the long-term gain. So the long-term game and the short-term game, we get to play them both at the same time. If you only play the short-term game, you're not setting yourself up for the future. But if you only play the long-term game, you're not going to make it there because there's a short-term piece that you get to create in the middle of it, okay? So we got to focus on short-term and long-term at the same time. That's the context of next week's show. How do you lead the short-term and the long-term at the same time? I see a lot of CEOs or company leaders and they say, I'm really good at the long term. And that's what they're talking about, which is wonderful, but they get to lead the short term as well. Okay. So both of those get to happen in tandem. So today we've covered better decision-making faster. I've given you the GLT process. We've talked about the heaviness that exists around us. You get to set that aside so that you can make decisions. Remember that never in the history of ever have decisions come out of that messy middle. So when you're in that place, you get to be in that place. It, as my friend Annie reminded me today, it's okay to not be okay. If you're in that messy middle, if you're experiencing that, yay, because you're feeling your feelings, you're letting it come out, that is beautiful. And that is not the place to lead from these big decisions. You can be vulnerable and share it. And that's an amazing place to be. And you get to get the support to set that aside so that you can move forward and create from a really powerful place. Those two, when I see that intersect, I've seen incredible things happen when companies are in what we would call crisis mode. And when we're talking about making decisions faster, we get to be able to learn how to set that aside and move forward. That is a practice, my friends, and it's all the stuff we've been talking about today, but it's truly practicing it. It's the art of knowing that this is how we live, that, that life is lifey, that there's always going to be stuff that comes up that happens and we get to keep moving through it. We cannot stop because life got messy. What would happen if we stopped? Companies would cease to exist. Things would change. 
but it doesn't have to be that way because we can make better decision making faster. And there's a whole bunch of resources out there to support you. Reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm happy to be there for you. Kathleen at KathleenReason.com. Thank you so much for listening today. See you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Kathleen Reason Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Kathleen Reason will return next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Have a great week.